not know that there is a book of the Bible that does not mention God. The name of God is not explicitly mentioned anywhere in the book of Esther. So you might wonder how that slip into our biblical canon. Isn't the Bible supposed to be about God? Well, yes, the Bible is about God. And in Esther, we see the sovereign hand of God evident in the events that take place, even though God is not explicitly mentioned by the author of the book of Esther. In fact, there's nothing religious at all in the book of Esther. Nobody even prays in the book of Esther. But this is instructive because there are times in life when we don't always see how God is working. But that doesn't mean God is not there. God is sometimes that silent, invisible presence behind the scenes. We don't know exactly how he's working, but he is there and he is still working. So the book of Esther does have a place in our biblical canon. It tells us, among other things, part of the history of Israel. Now when we talk about history, we're not talking about history for the sake of posterity. We're not talking about history for the sake of information. We're talking about theological history or how, how God is being revealed or how his purpose is being moved forward in human history. Now remember that God made certain promises to Abraham. Way back in Genesis chapter 12, God called Abraham and made certain promises about him and his seed. Part of that promise had to do with the land. Remember, he promised that he would give Abraham's descendants the land, the, the land that we, today we call Palestine. But in the book of Esther, the people of Israel are not in the land. They've been taken out of the land. And if you, if you know anything about uh, your scriptures, you know that that was because of their sin. They were in exile. And in this case, they're in the, the nation of Persia. The Persian Empire is in uh, power at this time. So the question might arise, does that mean God has deserted the Jewish people completely? Are they just sort of out there in the world on their own? Did God just kick them out of the land and say, you're on your own now, that's it, I'm not going to have anything, anything else to do with you? What, did, was God still going to fulfill his promises to Abraham? Amen. And the answer is yes, because the book of Esther is showing us that indeed God is still with his people, even though they're in exile, and even though he is actually punishing them for their sin. Now we know another part of that promise to Abraham had to do with Abraham's seed. And Paul says in Galatians 3.16 that that seed was Christ. Paul says it's not seeds which are many, but a singular seed who is Christ. So ultimately, God's purpose was to, through the Jewish people, bring the Messiah, his son, into the world. And so God had not abandoned his promise to Abraham. He had not abandoned his purpose. And he had not abandoned his people, even in their time of exile. The book of Esther tells us about a significant threat that came to the people of God while they were in exile and how that threat was put down. God is not mentioned explicitly, but it is clear that he is delivering his people just as he had done when they had been slaves in Egypt, and he is doing it. He is working deliverance by using individuals to do the work. In this story, the ind those individuals were Esther and her uncle, Mordecai. It is clear that both Esther and Mordecai have been raised up and placed in certain positions in, at just the right time. We often talk about being in the right place at the right time. And we usually call that a coincidence. You know, how did that happen? He was in just the right place at just the right time. And we, we sometimes say, what a, what a coincidence. A coincidence, by the way, is two incidents that happen simultaneously, and we don't always see how they happen together. Well, we know that in the book of Esther, the reason these coincidences happened is because God was making them happen. Amen. Now, at the same time, there was a wicked man named Haman who also rises to power. The book of Esther says that Haman is an Agagite. Now, do any of you remember Agag? Yes. 
There's a very interesting story about King Saul. King Saul was supposed to make war against the Amalekites. Agag was an Amalekite. And God had cursed that entire lineage because they had come out, when Israel had come into the promised land, they had come out and, and warred against Israel. And there's, there's things written about the Amalekites and Agag in particular in Exodus 17, in Deuteronomy 25, and in 1 Samuel 15. And God said, I'm at war from generation to generation, I'm at war with the Amalekites. I'm going to wipe them off the face of the earth. And here, lo and behold, the people of God are in captivity in Persia. And who should rise but an Agagite, an Amalekite named Haman, an enemy of the people of God. And Mordecai refuses to honor this man. And so Haman, he plans to not only kill Mordecai, but he's going to kill all of the Jews. That's, that's, his, uh, that's his plan. People weren't as polite back then, you see, as, as they are today. But it's through Esther's and Mordecai's bold efforts that the tables are turned. The Jews triumph over all those who sought their demise because of Haman, and the people established the Feast of Purim, which is still, still observed today, to commemorate their victory. The victory of the Jews was made possible by the shrewd and courageous acts of Mordecai and Esther. They both made crucial decisions to act in just the right way at just the right times. So even though God is not explicitly mentioned, it's clear that both Esther and Mordecai are being helped by God, and they are acting as his servants in behalf of the Jewish people. Amen. So as I said, this book concerns a difficult period for the people of God. They're captives in a foreign land, the Persians, who had taken over power from the Babylonians, who had originally carried the Jews, uh, at least the southern kingdom of Judah, into exile, these were not nice people. These were pagan yeah. people. They were ruthless people, uh, powerful people. It seemed, in, at the beginning of the book of Esther, it seems like the enemies of the Jews have the upper hand. It looks like God has deserted them, and it looks like, unless something happens, they're going to be wiped off the face of the earth. There's nothing... There's nothing at the beginning of the story to really stop that from happening until Mordecai and Esther begin to act. We learn from this that God's people are often placed in circumstances that are far from ideal, far from perfect. If, we, if we're somehow waiting for the perfect situation, the ideal situation, that's a little naive on our part. There aren't going to be any ideal situations. There aren't going to be any perfect situations for us as long as we're in this world. We're going to face enemies. We're going to face opposition. We're going to face difficult problems and circumstances that are not easy to, to resolve. The people of God are going to be tempted to compromise what we know is right, to disobey the law of God. We're going to experience pressure from pagan people. We're going to face persecution, violence, possibly loss of property or death. And God does not always mitigate these circumstances. Mitigate means he doesn't always like stop it from happening. And so his people must learn how to pass through these times and remain faithful. Now here are some of the key issues and questions that are raised and, and then answered in the book of Esther. For example, how can the people of God keep their faith in God in a context of hostility and opposition? How do you do that? It's not... It's not easy for us to keep our faith in here, right? It's when you go out there in the world and you're, in, you're, you're among unbelievers, that's when the, the troubles start. So how do we do that? How do we, keep a, how do we keep our faith in the context of hostility and opposition? Secondly, can the people count on God's deliverance or is it a futile exercise to do anything? I mean, should we just give up? Well, it doesn't... It, it's just not, not going to work. Nothing, nothing I do matters. Nothing I do is going to work. I might as well just give up. Whatever is going to happen is just going to happen. Is that how we should react to trouble? And here's another question. Should the people of God, and this is related, should the people of God be active or passive when facing opposition? So when you face opposition, should you just kind of sit there and do nothing? Should you just be completely passive or, or should you do something? And I think those, are, those questions are all addressed for us here in the book of Esther, and I'm going to try to answer, answer those, those questions. The book of Esther teaches the people of God how to think, and, and, and more importantly, how to act 
when faced with difficult or hostile circumstances. So Esther and Mordecai, I think, are excellent examples to us of how we, as Christians, should conduct ourselves in an evil world. You see, our situation is very similar to the Jews in Persia. They are a persecuted religious minority in a pagan environment. Does that sound familiar? That's exactly our situation. We are, a, we are a religious minority, and I'm using religious in the best sense. We are re a religious minority in a pagan culture. That's exactly our, our situation. So, so how should we behave ourselves? How should we react to that situation? Just like the Jews, we are exiles. We're exiles. We're strangers and aliens in the world. So how should we live in a place that is strange and potentially hostile to us? Well, I'm not going to develop these two points, but I want to just say there are two extremes we should avoid. There are two unbiblical extremes that we should avoid. When we're talking about how we should relate to the world around us, one extreme that we should avoid is to just compromise and blend in. You know, we can just kind of give up. Wait, wave the white flag and say, you know, let's just blend in with the culture. If we do that, then everybody will leave us alone. That's one extreme. It's not a biblical option. Another extreme is to try to physically separate ourselves from the world, to have little or no contact with the world around us. So let's, we can go out on the side of a mountain somewhere, you see, and, and kind of camp out and just separate ourselves from the world. But that's, that's not a biblical option. The third option that I think is biblical is something we might call righteous engagement, Good. to where we're not, we're not compromising with the world. We're not just going to bow down, but we're not going to just kind of separate ourselves either. We're going to be in the world, but we're going to refuse to be of the world. Amen. So we can count on God's help yeah. while we're in the world, because we are convinced that God is for us. The book of Esther is a perfect illustration. It's not the only illustration in the Bible, but it is a good illustration of that principle that we're all familiar with in Romans 8.28. We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Amen. Esther is an illustration of this, of this principle. There are other illustrations in the Bible. You can look at the life of Joseph is a, is a wonderful illustration of this principle also. So God's not going to desert his people in their time of need. However, that does not mean that we are to be passive. We are to trust God, but we must also think and act in a way that serves the purpose of God. So we're not, we're not passive uh, we're not just kind of sitting there watching what goes on like we're spectators. We're actively involved in God's purpose. You will notice, though, and you've probably experienced this, that those things that God works together for our good, those things may not be good in and of themselves. It's not that God only sends good things our way because we're his children and then shelters us from everything that's bad. What Paul is saying in Romans 8 is that God is able to work out a good ending, one that is according to his purpose, even when the individual threads of our lives were less than ideal. And since there are no ideal situations in a fallen world, we must rely on God's ability to work good things out of this mess, otherwise it's not going to work at all. So the book of Esther is yet another biblical illustration of God's sovereign grace Toward his people. We should remember that it was God who put the people of Israel in captivity in the first place. And that's the setting for the book of Esther. But God is still God even in Persia. Amen. He's over all of the nations. Amen. This is also something that was revealed to the prophet Daniel, who was also in captivity in Babylon and then in Persia. God is ruling and reigning over the nations of the world. And so when bad things happen to God's people, this does not in any way contradict the rule and reign of God. So if something bad is happening to God's people, that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean somehow God's purpose is being thwarted or that, or that God isn't sovereign. Not at all. God is still on his throne and Ezekiel also who was in captivity, saw the throne of God. It's interesting that both Daniel and Ezekiel, while they were in captivity, both men had visions of the throne of God. Now, why do you think that was? Why would a prophet in captivity need to see a vision of the throne of God? 
Well, I mean, the, thr the throne of God, is, is it that God is a, a guy sitting on a throne up in heaven, up, upstairs somewhere? No, that's a, that's, a, that's a picture of something about God. God is ruling. God is reigning. And, and Ezekiel, now, and this is true, even though, the, even though Jerusalem's destroyed, God's still on his throne. See? It, what about the temple? I thought God's throne was in the temple. What if the temple's destroyed? Does that mean... No, God's still on his throne. Even, even, even if his people are in Persia, even if Jerusalem's destroyed, even if the temple's destroyed, God's still on his throne. I, I love the fact that Ezekiel even saw a throne with wheels. God can get around. Amen. Right? Amen. Is, is God located to one place in the earth? No. He's got a throne with wheels. And so when Ezekiel saw the throne of God, he saw it had... A wheel in a wheel it could go in any direction. God's everywhere. God's, God's glory is everywhere in the earth. There's not a place you can go in this world where God's not reigning. Amen. Amen. Even in places of captivity and suffering and opposition. And that's why, see, the people of God always have a reason to have hope. Amen. Even in their exile. Amen. So times of suffering, times of trial, times of opposition from wicked men are not necessarily signs of God's abandonment. Now, this contradicts a lot of popular teaching in the church. The prosperity gospel is embraced by millions who want to believe that the sign of God's love and favor is a happy, healthy, wealthy, and successful life, as we define that as 21st century Americans. And so we must conclude that if you are not enjoying prosperity in that sense, then you must somehow be spiritually deficient. And so during their darkest nights of trouble, when they need the most comfort and encouragement, many of God's people are told that they lack faith, or that they, or they would not be in this difficult situation. See, and so there's so many examples in Scripture of just tearing that whole idea apart. Job, actually, that we studied this morning, is one of those examples. Amen. Amen. Now, we know that God can prosper and deliver His people. And that's illustrated in the book of Esther as well. But what I'm utterly rejecting is the idea that God will spare His people from all adversity. That's just not true. Actually, actually, adversity may be evidence that God's working with us. The adversity may be the evidence that God is working with us. Not that he's abandoned us, but just the opposite, that he's working with us. I'll give you a couple of examples. First of all, adversity may be the discipline of the Lord. That's what was happening to Judah. That's why they were in Persia in the first place. They were being disciplined. God actually called to the people of Israel his firstborn son, and they needed discipline, just like firstborn sons need discipline. Uh, I, I was one. I am one. Believers in Christ are to accept hardship as discipline, it says in Hebrews 12. If you're, if you're going through some hardship, maybe it's some discipline. You should accept it that way. God's treating you as a son. Doesn't mean because you're going through a hard time, does that mean God's just, he's, he hates your guts? No. Is it? He's treating you like a son, like his child. Furthermore, adversity is in the form of opposition is simply the natural consequence of living in a world that's wicked and opposed to God. So, like, what do you think is going to happen? If you're in a world that's wicked and opposed to God and you belong to God, what do you think is going to happen? Well, you're going to face some opposition. It's just, it's just logical. It's just reasonable. God's people have enemies like wicked Haman who hate them for no good reason except perhaps that the people of God are different and won't bow to the world's demands. Jesus warned the disciples that the world would hate them because it hated him, it hated the Father. That's John 15, 18 to 25. So let's dismiss, and I don't think we have any problem with that here, but let's dismiss any foolish and unrealistic notions that if we are the people of God, we're just going to float through the world on a couch of ease and comfort. It's not going to happen. However, when we're in the midst of some kind of trouble, it can be very difficult for us to see the hand of the Lord. In fact, we may conclude that he has abandoned us. It's not hard to feel that God is blessing us when everything is going our way. It is sometimes extremely difficult for us to see the hand of God in our troubles. And that's why we need the book of Esther. God is hidden in the book of Esther, but he's still there. Sometimes God hides himself. And we cannot always see how he is working out his purpose. But the truth is, is that God is always working. God never stops Amen. working. He is moving both people and events Amen. toward his ultimate goal, and we have to learn how to trust in the Lord even when we can't see him. Amen. The old theologians had a term for this. They called it providence. Amen. 
the providence of God. The book of Esther is a case study on the providence of God. And I kind of prefer the word sovereignty better. I don't think you read the word providence in any of the Bible translations, but it's a similar concept. Now there is a series, I'm going to summarize the whole book of Esther here, okay? There's a series of events in the book of Esther that we might call coincidences. They're just things that seem to happen for no apparent reason at just the right time. Yeah. For example, it all begins, the whole story of Esther begins when the king of Persia got drunk. Now, most of the time we would say, no, nobody would say, he got drunk. Oh, God must be working. But that's exactly what was happening. Because if the king hadn't gotten drunk, he wouldn't have asked his queen Vashti to come out and show herself to him and all of his nobles. And Vashti, for reasons every woman in this room can understand, said, I am not going to do that. And for that, that was a very, that's a very brave thing for her to do, but for that, she was removed from the throne. But see, that had to happen. So if the king hadn't gotten drunk, and if the king hadn't called for his queen, and if Vashti hadn't said no, then she wouldn't have been deposed. So now we have a vacancy. There's no queen. Well, it just so happens that Esther is chosen as one of the young women to go before the king. And she wins, it says in the text, she wins everyone's approval. Just so happens that they like Esther better than everyone else, especially the king. And so she just happens to be chosen as the new queen. That's in chapter 2, verses 1 to 18. Now, because Esther's in the palace, Mordecai, Esther's uncle and guardian, is hanging around the palace. And it just so happens that as he's hanging around the palace, he overhears a plot by two of the king's guards to assassinate the king. And so he warns the king, the king's life is saved, the deed is recorded, but for some strange reason, Mordecai is not rewarded. Hmm. Meanwhile... Haman rises to power and is enraged that Mordecai will not honor him. And so he decides to go home and build a gallows on which to hang Mordecai. It just happened that the next night the king can't sleep. I would imagine if you're a king, you're very busy. Most nights you'd be ready to hit the hay and go to sleep, right? He can't sleep for some strange reason. And for some strange reason, he wants to read the royal records. Bring the royal records out. I can't sleep. Bring, bring the royal records. I mean, it's what I would do. And so he is reminded that there was this man named Mordecai who saved his life. And the king says, what was done for this man? Nothing. It just so happens that at that very moment, who should show up but wicked Haman? And Haman's on a mission to get the king to give him permission to hang Mordecai, the guy who just was brought up in the record, on the gallows that he made at home. And so the whole thing is turned around on Haman. Yeah. Haman is humiliated. He has to walk with Mordecai through the street saying, this is the man the king delights to honor, the guy that he wants to kill. And Mordecai is honored publicly as, a, as one favored by the king. All of that had to happen first, you see, so that when Esther finally reveals herself and says, I'm a Jew, and she reveals the plot of Haman to the king, Haman can then be hung on the very gallows he built for Mordecai, yeah. while Mordecai is already now known to the king and is therefore very easily exalted to take Haman's place so that he can undo the evil planned against the Jews by Haman. Just, just happened to work out that way. Because of Mordecai's exalted position and favor with the king, everyone is now afraid to attack the Jews and they overcome their enemies. That's the story of the book of Esther. See all those things that just kind of happened? Yeah. It's coincidence, you know. It just happened that way. I'm being sarcastic, of course. They, weren't, they didn't just happen. God was working behind the scenes. Now, God isn't specifically mentioned, but we know. Yeah. We know what was going on. Amen. Now, who could have made that happen except for God? No Hollywood writer could have written a story like that. Only God can write an ending like that. So even though the writer never mentions God, we must conclude that God was working behind the scenes. Yeah. 
And I don't think it's one of those situations where the writer of Esther got done writing his or her, or her book and said, oh, you know, I'm, I feel like I'm forgetting something. Oh, I forgot to mention God. No, this, this is an intentional omission. It's an intentional omission because the reader is left to come to that conclusion. We're left to fill in the blanks and read, the lo- read between the lines. So when we read the book of Esther, we go, ah, we know why that happened. See, I know why that happened at just the right time. Oh, Haman's building a, look, Haman's building a gallows. Ha, ah, we know what's going to happen. We know why he's building those gallows, see. So Esther's different from every other book in the Bible. Doesn't mention God, but even, it's, even in its silence, the book of Esther is teaching us about God. You see, all those events I just listed, those, those, those seem to be kind of mundane. None of those things are exceptionally miraculous in and of themselves. You see, when we read the Bible, we're used to God showing up and doing spectacular things. That's what we're waiting for. We're waiting for something spectacular in the book of Esther. You know, like ten plagues. Why didn't he just bring ten more plagues on Persia? That would fix them. Uh, you know, part a sea or something. You know, he parted the Red Sea. Did something amazing. We expect God to show up in miracles. Fire from heaven. The mouths of lions to be shut. Fiery furnaces not to burn human flesh. That isn't what happens in Esther. It's just these little mundane things that could almost escape your attention if you weren't paying attention. And that's probably what happens in our lives. God probably hasn't shown up and parted any seas for you lately. He probably hasn't made ten plagues come up on your enemies lately. But God is there. Though he's hidden, and if we are looking for God only in thunder and lightning, we will probably conclude that he is not involved in our lives at all, and we would be wrong. God is there in a thousand little things that we usually do not see or that we simply chalk up to coincidence. Sometimes in retrospect, we can look back and see the invisible hand of providence in our lives. We see that if that thing had not happened, I would not have this wonderful blessing now. Do you know what I'm talking about? I suppose we will all have to wait to see all of the ways that God worked in our lives as he brought his dear children along the path to glory. But sometimes, even in this life, we can understand things in retrospect. Retrospect means looking back. You know what they say, hindsight is twenty twenty. You look back and you say, I didn't realize that then, but that terrible thing that happened that I thought was so terrible, if that hadn't happened, I wouldn't have made this decision, and then this other thing wouldn't have happened, and I wouldn't be in the wonderful blessing place where I am right now. Amen. That's right. Understanding what God is doing in the middle of any given situation, especially a trial, is almost impossible unless we were to have some kind of direct revelation. When we read the Bible, we are used to God giving direct revelation. Why didn't God just say, Esther, do you know why you're married to the king now? But he doesn't do that. He doesn't do that. He doesn't speak directly. There is no revelation given. There's only silence, and it's the silence that disturbs us. It's what disturbed Job. Job said, why? I just want God to tell me why this is going on. We want to know what God is up to. So how do we deal with silence? What do we do when we don't know what to do? What do we do when God hasn't spoken specifically? Well, we have two excellent examples in Esther and Mordecai. Somehow, Esther and Mordecai knew what they should do. Even though God didn't say, hey, Esther, (laughs) hey, Mordecai, here's what I want you to do. First, you're going to go, and there's nothing like that. But Esther and Mordecai just know what to do. However, we have to deal with the fact first. Let's talk about Esther a little bit. This is, a, this is not an ideal situation for a young woman. Is it? I mean, do you think Esther wanted to go spend the night with the king? I don't think so. She was forced. She didn't have a choice. This is not America. This is Persia. This absolute totalitarian regime in power, she, she and about, probably about a hundred other young women were just taken. They're the king's property. This is not an ideal situation. And, and Esther was probably a young woman, and we see that she is, a, initially, she is very reluctant to do what she needs to do. She's afraid. And she says to her, her uncle Mordecai, Uh, In chapter 4, verse 11, she says, I have not been invited to see the king for 30 days. What do you think she's afraid of? 
You don't just waltz into the presence of the king of Persia. If she waltzes into the presence and interrupts something, if she makes him mad, remember what happened to Vashti? She's taking her life into her hands to go unbidden into the presence of the king. Now, at this point, Esther does not look like a person of faith. She doesn't look like someone who's as bold as a lion and says, yes, I will do it. I will walk into the king and tell him what I want. She doesn't want to do it. But that's not the end of the story. I said, that's her initial response. But that's not the end of her story. God was working with Esther. And he was doing it through her, her uncle, Mordecai. Mordecai's answer to Esther's fear is the passage that Emma read. And I think it's probably the key passage in the entire book of Esther. Mordecai says to her, do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. Yes, yes. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Amen. Now, I want you to notice, first of all, Mordecai's confident faith in God, even though he doesn't mention God, notice what he said. Deliverance will rise for the Jews. Now, where did he get that confidence? Amen. He's confident in God. The only question was whether or not Queen Esther would be willing to play her part in God's work. You see, even when we are afraid, and even when we do not understand what God may be doing behind the scenes, we must continue to live by faith and continue to do what we know is right. We have to learn how to live wisely, we have to learn how to be bold when necessary. And God will bless our efforts if we do these things. You ever hear someone say the water doesn't part until your feet get wet? See, that if God blesses the boldness, but if you're not bold, you won't get the blessing. If we draw back, if we allow fear to dominate, God will not be pleased with us. That's what Hebrews 10.39 says. He doesn't take any pleasure in those who draw back. See, God's work and purpose. Now, you may draw back. Is that going to hinder God's purpose? No. Mordecai said, Esther, deliverance will arise from another place, but you'll be left behind. God's work and purpose will continue on without us if we, if we draw back. Now, Mordecai's crucial word to Queen Esther shows us that the work of God must be done by the people of God. If God was working in the background, it was Mordecai and Esther who were working in the foreground. We don't see in Esther what God was doing, but we do see what God's people were doing. Mm -hmm. See, Now that seems to be wrong. That doesn't seem to be very biblical. We're used to God performing mighty acts, which are impossible for men to do. We've been trained to think that it is only God's work that matters, and our work just gets in the way of what God wants to do. And so the best thing we can do is to just do nothing and let God do it all, right? What if Mordecai and Esther had reasoned like that? What if Esther had refused to go to the king? Esther could have said, well, I'm not going in there. He could kill me. God's just going to have to figure out another way. What if Mordecai and Esther had organized prayer meetings and then done nothing else? Mordecai was confident that deliverance would arise for the Jews, and then he purposed, with Esther's help, to be that very deliverance. Mordecai exhorted Esther to be active, not passive, and to do what was in her power to do. Amen. Later, when the king had exalted Mordecai, he was again proactive in countermanding the plot of Haman. So in, in every situation, Esther and Mordecai are proactive, proactive. They're acting, they're acting. They're not sitting there and doing nothing. They're doing what they can do in the situation. And Mordecai seemed to be supremely confident that whatever he and Esther did would be successful. Now, why was he so confident? Was, was he just arrogant? Now, there are some people who do act out of their own pride for their own purposes. That's exactly what Haman did. And Haman's plans came to nothing. Haman is a perfect example of the fact that pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Proverbs 16, 18. And so in this way, Haman and Mordecai provide an instructive contrast 
Haman is a proud man working for himself. Mordecai is a faithful man working for God. And we know who was successful. Mordecai was confident and proactive because he knew that no man can successfully oppose God as Haman was doing. And conversely, no man can fail who has aligned himself with God. And I thought about this verse from Psalm 34, 15 and 16. It says, the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ear toward their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the memory of them from the earth. It's exactly what happened in the book of Esther. So Mordecai knew he had to do something, but whatever he did would be successful because he was doing the will of God. You can't beat God's people because you can't beat God. If God is for us, then who can be against us? So at every stage in this story, we see Mordecai and Esther acting in concert with God. There's a kind of synergy between these providential coincidences and the bold, wise actions of the human actors. It is as if Esther and Mordecai were in perfect sync with God and what he was doing. They were making all the right moves and all the right decisions at all the right moments. And so clearly the Jews were saved by the brave actions of Esther and Mordecai. Esther and Mordecai saved the Jews, is what I'm saying. Now, we can't claim all the credit for the victory, but we do participate in the purpose of God. And what we do does matter for the advancement of God's purpose. Now, having said that, it's also clear that God was working, albeit silently, behind the scenes to save his covenant people. And there are some things, let's be honest, there are some things only God can do. There's only so much we can do. And then God has to, to do the rest. God's people always trace their salvation back to what God has done. However, however, God does not simply thunder out of heaven and command salvation like he commanded the creation of the world. Salvation, you might say, it's not that salvation is harder for God. It's that salvation is more complex than creation. The book of Esther is really about how God provides salvation. You see, Esther is an intercessor for the Jews. She pleads for their lives before the king. Mordecai, on the other hand, is an exalted ruler who is placed in a position of authority for the sake of his people. And so, mark this, for the Jews to be saved and to be victorious over their enemies, they needed two things. They needed an intercessor and they needed an exalted ruler. Now, Esther became the intercessor for the people of Israel. She had to abandon herself, to give herself up to death even, when she determined to go before the king and intercede for her people. She said in chapter 4, verse 16, if I perish, I perish, but I'm going to do it anyway. And she was received by the king. He held out the scepter to her. She was received by the king, and her intercession was heard. This reminds us of the one who died more than that, who was raised who is at the right hand of God and who also is interceding for us. Amen. Romans 8, 34. Now it was Mordecai's position that made the final victory of the Jewish people possible. For it says in Esther 9, verse 4, Mordecai was great in the king's house and his fame spread throughout all the provinces. For the man Mordecai grew more and more powerful. This reminds us of how God has exalted Jesus. He has put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. That's Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. So we are victorious because Jesus has been exalted. God has provided for our salvation by supplying both an intercessor and an exalted ruler in Jesus, just like he provided in Esther and Mordecai, an intercessor and an exalted ruler to save their lives. Salvation requires a sovereign God. What if God wanted to save his people but couldn't do it? Just couldn't do it. Or on, on the other hand, what if God did not want to save his people? Would it matter then what we did to save ourselves? If God didn't want to save his people, do you think anything Esther and Mordecai would have done would have been productive? I don't think so. Now, there are some people who interpret the sovereignty of God to mean that there is nothing that we do that makes a difference. 
In fact, you can push sovereignty and predestination to such an extreme that even prayer becomes irrelevant. I mean, why pray if everything's already been determined by a sovereign God? Why do anything at all? If Esther and Mordecai had thought that way, then they would have accepted the fate of the Jews as a God-ordained decree. So we must strike a balance between trusting in God's sovereignty while also being willing to do the will of God in concrete ways. I do not mean to imply that we can earn our salvation. But being saved by grace means also doing the good works that God has prepared beforehand for us to do. Amen. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. So trusting in the sovereignty of God does not imply that the people of God can afford to be simple or foolish. Esther and Mordecai both acted with forethought, wisdom, and tactfulness. Furthermore, the people of God are exiles, and that means there will be a strong temptation to compromise with the pagan culture. We see this pressure on Mordecai when Haman is exalted by the king. Mordecai is the only one, apparently, who refused to bow to Haman. God's people have to understand that the world is really not tolerant of people who don't conform. There are times when we will have to draw a line in the sand and refuse to bow. Trusting in the sovereignty of God does not mean we expect God to make everybody be our friend. Amen. It means that when we do have to take a stand, a stand we know will probably have consequences, we trust in our sovereign God to take care of us. Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. 1 Peter 4.19 We don't always know what will happen when we live to please God, and that's not our business. Our business is to live to please God. Amen. And we trust Him no matter what might happen to us the rest of the time. You see, even after Esther exposes the plot of Haman and, and Mordecai is exalted to take Haman's place, the Jews still have to fight. Mm -hmm. If you read ahead in chapter 9, verses 5 and verse 16, it says they had to fight their enemies. But now their fighting is effectual. Mm -hmm. And they triumph over their enemies. I don't know who said this, but someone has said, every Jewish holiday is the same. They tried to kill us. We won. <laughs> now, in some sense, Esther and Mordecai had already won the victory, and the rest of the Jews benefited from that victory. Sound familiar? Yes. The rest of the fighting was just a consolidation of the victory that Esther and Mordecai had already won. Now, the Christian's in a similar position. Jesus has already won the decisive victory. He spoiled principalities and powers, triumphing over them through his cross. He is seated at the right hand of God in heaven, far above every other earthly power. The plots of our enemy, Satan, have been exposed and utterly defeated. However, there's still some fighting left to do. God's people still have enemies. We are still in the world and aliens and strangers in a world that is opposed to Jesus Christ. Now, we don't fight a physical war like they did, but we have to be armed for a spiritual battle, and we cannot be intimidated by conflict. Amen. Amen. That does not mean we are confident in our own ability, but we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Amen. Thank you. And Brother Gene's going to exhort us.